you would, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Isaiah, chapter 7, looking at uh, actually the first uh, 14 verses of uh, this uh, book this morning. So Isaiah 7, uh, starting in verse 1. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezim and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus. And the head of Damascus is resin, and within sixty-five years Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse uh, the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. I'm sure, like, uh, uh, like us, most of you have got uh, all your Christmas decorations uh, up and uh, the house is merry and bright. Uh, but um, one of the things that uh, I have realized uh, the older I've gotten, also being a, a dog owner as well, I'll, I'll mention that in just a second, but uh, that there's a, sort of a law of diminishing returns when it comes to Christmas. Once you sort of get to be a teenager, I think, uh, some of the magic dissipates. Some of the hope uh, goes uh, away. Certainly only a dog, uh, he thinks that we have decorated the place, certainly the tree, uh, with dog toys. And that's always fun uh, to clean up uh, around the house. Um, also speaks to, I think, this law of diminishing returns of Christmas. Uh, we uh, know, or at least we, we, we are told everywhere we go, that Christmas is to bring great hope. And I think the lights and the tinsel and the trees all uh, maybe do that temporarily for us. Uh, but before long, right, the, the tree starts to dry out if you have a live tree. Uh, lights break, uh, get replaced, whatnot. And you start to realize, well, maybe this hope uh, that we have, uh, at least where the world tells us it is, uh, is totally insufficient. I think that's 
certainly the case for the hope of King Ahaz here uh, in this passage in Isaiah uh, this morning. That um, uh, the context, uh, you can pick up a little bit from what we read, but I'll, I'll just briefly review it with you. Uh, Assyria is the superpower at this time. Uh, Assyria is on the move, is, is pressing west and south. Uh, under the leadership of the fantastically named Tiglath Pileser III. I think the thing that kills me most about this name is the third part. Uh, there came with the last name Gretzinger, there was that time every the beginning of every school year where you had to correct your teachers and say, no, it's Gretzinger. You would think that Tiglath Pileser Jr. Uh, would have sort of spared his son of that embarrassment, but obviously not. And so Tiglath Pileser III uh, is leading uh, the Assyrian armies in their uh, conquests. Uh, the northern kingdom, uh, that is the ten tribes of uh, uh, Israel, uh, uh, known as the northern kingdom, have joined forces with Syria. Uh, they are in league with uh, the Syrians to try and stand against uh, the Assyrians. I know that's a little confusing, um, but the Israeli-Syrian cohort are now leaning heavily upon the kingdom of Judah, the small kingdom uh, of these uh, two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, uh, and have tried to force them to join with them. Ahaz has uh, refused. Uh, and now there is a plot. You uh, sort of see that there in verses six, uh, verse six really, where uh, the, the idea is to come and replace Ahaz uh, by force and put uh, a puppet king in place of him. Uh, the year is 734 BC. And so King Ahaz of Judah is fearful really for two reasons here. Uh, he's afraid, first of all, of the Assyrian threat coming to uh, wipe them out, uh, but more so the uh, threat of rebellion within his kingdom. He's afraid of this Israeli-Syrian uh, uh, alliance coming uh, and deposing him. And so when Isaiah and Notice uh, his son goes with him there in verse 3. We'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, when they find him, when they approach him, Ahaz is inspecting uh, Jerusalem's water supply. And we think most likely the reason he's doing this is because he's anticipating a long siege of his capital city. And so... Uh, Ahaz's plan is to try and endure the Syro uh, or Syrian uh, Israeli forces that siege it. And then when Assyria comes down, to somehow try and pay them off, submitting to the greater army. You can see it's a, it's a hopeless situation, really. Uh, he's going to uh, likely have to pay tribute and uh, put his faith in one of these two armies. He's hoping it's the uh, bigger one uh, under uh, uh, Tiglath Pileser, but uh, he's really uncertain. And so this man has uh, no hope at all. And I wonder sometimes if as the Christmas season comes upon us, uh, we feel a little bit of that hopelessness as well. Uh, if we sort of start to realize that, yes, uh, the hope that we have uh, uh, set our feet upon is maybe shifting a little bit. And so Isaiah comes to this man who is putting his hope, putting his faith in people and militaries and military alliances, and he offers him a radical alternative. You see that there in verses uh, 8 and 9. He says, you know, this will not stand. Uh, that uh, these two uh, countries are going to be wiped out. 
And then in verse 9, he says, The head of Ephraim is Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom. The head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. And then he offers him this. He says, If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. It's chastisement. It's saying to him that you have uh, not put your faith where it needs to be. You are trusting in man. And this will always be a shifting uh, place to put your faith. And so, we have to ask ourselves, how can we be firm in our faith? How can we, this holiday season, not just endure Christmas until uh, the 26th and just sort of get through it, but actually get something meaningful out of Christmas and have it be a way of building us up in our faith. Because after all, the words to Ahaz are, are the same to us today. If we are not firm in our faith, we will not be firm at all. So first of all, the nature of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 offers us this brilliant definition of faith. He says, this is, the author says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of of things not seen. So there is this idea that, that our faith is in something that we cannot see. Now, uh, I think it's important to point out here, first of all, that, that, that there is a, a negative definition of faith here. And I think you see that in Ahaz, and you see that in your own the Bible teaches us that, that the opposite of faith is fear. That fear is the opposite of faith. And I think we could go even a step further here and, and say, well, what is Ahaz's problem? There's a guy that doesn't seem to have much faith. What, what's he afraid of? Well, we said it already, political leaders. Uh, in the counseling world, we would call this fear of man. Those political leaders that we're uh, afraid of, the changes that they're going to bring about, that they're going to make. Uh, uh, fear of bosses at work. Fear of maybe church members sometimes, or corporate policies, or uh, quite simply attitudes of the day. I remember back in 2012, uh, uh, I... I don't know why I say it like I'm at an AA meeting, but I'm a, I'm a Detroit Tigers fan. Um, and back in 2012, they, they had a really good team. That was sort of their year, and, and of course, they blew it. Uh, but their ace pitcher, Justin Verlander, was starting that uh, all-star game, and so I was watching intently. And in all the pregame interviews with the uh, players, I uh, uh, was sort of strongly taken aback by a question that they asked every single player there. And they asked them, uh, how would you feel uh, if you had a homosexual teammate? Cameras rolling on the spot. What do you say? What do you do? It's a moment when you have to confront the fear of man. And I bring this up because... Uh, probably will never have that situation happen to you, but, but others very similar to it. Where you are, are forced into a corner. Where people will call you to uh, decide and to take a stand. And, and you have to make up your mind. Will you stand firm in your faith? Or will you give in to the fear that surrounds and so, uh, this is the decision facing Ahaz here. And it's, it's a fascinating passage, really. I mean, it's, it, we, we could, could take several sermons from this uh, text. Uh, but notice God's response to this quivering king of Judah. In um, uh, verse 10, God comes to Ahaz and says, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. You see what that shows us about our God? That he's a long-suffering God. 
that he continues to pursue after his servant, the king. That in spite of his unfaithfulness, Ahaz, God continues to pursue after him. I don't know what your personal testimony is in faith, but, but mine certainly attests to this. A wandering teenager, a wandering college student, that eventually had to come to terms with a God that relentlessly pursues after his children. God is a long-suffering God, and he's incredibly gracious to Ahaz here. Ahaz, uh, ask a sign, any sign. You see that there, be, whether it be as deep as the grave or as high as that. Ask whatever you want. I will give you a sign to build you up, to strengthen your faith. And alas, Ahaz's response shows that the king has no faith at all. Quoting Deuteronomy 6 here in a, a sort of tribute to uh, religiosity, is I will not put the Lord to the test. It sounds pretty good on the surface, but below the surface it reflects that this man's heart has no faith in God whatsoever. But nevertheless, God gives him the sign anyway. He says, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. This gets us to our second point here this morning, that, that, that uh, the nature of faith uh, uh, is hoping in things uh, not seen, being convicted of it, uh, pointing us to the very substance of what this faith is. Our faith ultimately is not built on man or our own selves or our own abilities to do things or not to do things. Our faith, the substance, there is substance of it, are the promises of God. And, and we see that all over this passage. Let me just give you uh, uh, one or two examples here. I'll give you two. If you look at verse 3, uh, Isaiah is sent out with his son, Sheer Jashub. Quite literally, the son's name means a remnant shall return. What's that all about? Well, if you know the promises of God, then, then you should. Uh, we just spent uh, 12 weeks, longer than 12 weeks, actually studying these covenants of God, these promises that he has made to us in Sunday school. Uh, if you're not attending Sunday school, I, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, uh, excellent uh, way of building yourself up in the faith and being built up. Um, uh, this is a reference back to a promise made many, many years before to Abraham. Actually, really to, to Adam. That God will always have a people, in other words. This is demonstrated to, to Adam, certainly, in that uh, the promised seed would come from his line. Uh, but to Abraham, certainly, remember, he, God fills that in a little bit more. He says that, that, you know, your descendants will be more numerous than the sands of the sea or the stars in the sky. It's this promise that God will always have a people here in this world. And he's reminding Ahaz that, yes, destruction is coming. And, and in a hundred or so years, in 587 or 586 uh, B.C., uh, the Assyrians will no longer be a threat, but the Babylonians will. They're going to come, they're going to break down the walls of Jerusalem, they're going to carry the people away. God's covenant curse is going to come upon them. Those people who, interestingly, uh, once began in Babylon. Remember Abraham, descendant, born in Babylon? Now God's people will be carried back to the very place where they began to start over again. But... Here's God's promise to them. It's really just by way of reminding Ahaz and others. A remnant shall return. 
God reassures him by the very promises that he makes. I made the promise, God says, therefore you can trust him. You can build your life upon the promises that he makes. And then in verse 14, we start to see the consummation of all these promises that God makes. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Ahab, cheer up. Strengthen yourself. Be firm in your faith. Why? Because it's built upon my promises. And what is the chief of that? That, that I will be your God and you will be my people. I will forge a relationship with you that is stronger, that is built and, and, and solidified and sealed through the strongest bonds the world has ever known. My covenant love will be poured upon my people, God says. And you will know this because he will never depart from you. God is with you. Of course, we see that in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is the very substance of your faith and mine. I've used this illustration many, many times, and I, I think I've used it already here, but it has served me well in my own life. And around this time, you'll notice, I uh, noticed just the other day driving uh, down to Walmart from here, uh, the little ponds there by the, the, the apartments right there are starting to ice over. Uh, and they're still not at a very good ice level. I wouldn't want to walk across uh, those ponds right now. Uh, but uh, I want you to imagine with me that, 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 that you have to for some unforeseen reason. And you start off across the pond or any frozen will suffice, certain that you're going to go crashing through the ice. And in one scenario, you are as fearful as fearful can be, and yet, you make it across the ice. Second scenario would be very different. You start off with all the confidence in the world, sure that you're going to make it across that ice, and yet you go crashing through the waters below to your own demise. Now what's the difference in those two scenarios? The difference is the object in which you are putting your feet upon. It has nothing to do with what you think or don't think is going to happen. It doesn't really even matter how much faith you have in that ice. It just takes a very little bit to get you out there. What matters in both these scenarios, both of these situations, is the object in which you're putting your faith into. And I would say that it's exactly the same for us in our lives and how we are to live the mountains. What are you putting your faith in? What is the object of your faith? Ahaz shows his hand here. He, he shows exactly where his faith is. It's not in God. It's not in his promises. It's not in his son. It's somewhere else. But the, even the, the, the psalm that we're using to set our liturgy this morning too, Psalm 40, speaks to us of this. The object of your faith must be Jesus Christ as he's been promised to you by God many, many years ago. If your faith is not there, then ultimately they're going to come crashing down. And so, that's my question for you this morning. Where is your faith? What are you trusting in this holiday season? What are you trusting in in January or February or your March on down the line? The only thing, the only sane thing to put your faith in, I would add, is the promises of God, the chief of which is that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. Why? 
because he has sent his son, Jesus, God, with us. So that's the substance of the Christian's faith. Thirdly and finally, we, we look at this and we say, well, how does that affect our lives? Well, it didn't go very well for Ahaz, unfortunately, but it can go much better for you. Verses 15 and 16 are, are interesting, somewhat unusual uh, uh, verses. Talks about Jesus and says, He shall eat curds and honey, and when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. What's that all about? Well, curds and honey uh, back in Isaiah's time was the, uh, the, the food, the diet of kings. And so he's saying here, this is not just any ordinary child that's going to be born uh, to this virgin. Uh, it's actually a king. And so that's the, the first thing that we see. Faith is following after the king. That's how it works. That we have a great king in Jesus. He is King Jesus. We must submit our lives to him. We must bow our knees to him. And even when time gets tough, and times do, and they are tough right now, especially in those times, we must continue to submit ourselves and our lives to him, trusting that he knows best, trusting that he will see us through to the very end. How do we know that? Well, because he's promised you. Can build your life upon that promise. The second way this faith uh, is worked out. Verse 16, before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. What's that all about? The, before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about, uh, first of all, that 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 Jesus is fully man, and that there is a learning curve for this child, like there is with any other child. But notice what he says about him in his perfect humanity, that he will refuse what is evil and choose what is good. See, he's referring us back here to a very, very important principle in the scriptures. And I'll just throw out this theological term to you. It's known as the active obedience of Christ. You see, Jesus came with a job to do. Jesus came to fulfill God's law perfectly. And that means that he had to refuse the evil and to choose what is good? And so every single time that you read through the Gospels, you see him doing this, fulfilling the work that God gave him to do, turning away from that which is sinful, choosing the good, fulfilling God's uh, law absolutely perfectly, doing what Adam, you recall, was called to do originally which was to live his life according to God's law. Adam failed. Jesus is successful. And so, in his active obedience, he attains perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness that you and I, when we put our faith in Jesus, embrace this righteousness that is not yours. And thereby, it's when, when you accept Jesus by faith, when you uh, stand firm in him, you are declaring a righteousness that is not your own. But, and here's the good news of this, when you stand firm in faith in Jesus Christ and his perfect righteousness, it's as though you have never sinned. It's as though you've never broken God's law. This is how we stand before God the Father. He doesn't look at you according to your sins or what you've done or not done. He looks at you through his son, Jesus. That's how he sees you in his righteousness. 
you stand perfect before the throne of God. J. Gresham Machen, the founder of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, a great man, uh, uh, died many years ago, took pneumonia up in uh, uh, Minnesota, I believe. Why anybody would want to visit Minnesota this time of year is beyond me. Um, but be careful if you're going. Um, Machen took uh, pneumonia uh, and died uh, there. Uh, but I've always been very struck by his dying words uh, uh, in a, a phone call uh, to one of his colleagues at Westminster Seminary. He quite simply said, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. And this is true for all of us. There is no hope for any of us save the active obedience of Christ, the work that he has done on your behalf. Because there's one last outworking here that you'll notice, and that is judgment. Judgment comes upon God's people. Judgment comes upon Assyria upon Syria, upon the northern kingdom, eventually upon the southern kingdom as well. The only way to stand and to be spared from the judgment of God is to clothe yourself in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's a righteousness that is not your own, it's not mine, or we are not righteous by birth, only by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in him, does our righteousness come from him. So, as you approach uh, the remainder of this holiday season, I hope you will see that true hope lies beyond yourself, beyond the glitz and the, the, the tinsel of uh, our world. The true hope comes only by building your life upon the promises of God and trusting them and knowing that they are true. We cannot always see them, but we hope for them. We are convicted that these things not seen come true. And we see that in Christmas, in Jesus coming, in our Emmanuel being with us and drawing us close to God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that uh, we have a hope in your son Jesus and his finished work in his perfect life, his death upon the cross. We pray that uh, our lives uh, would be transformed by that, that our Christmases would be transformed by that, and that the world would see that the only true hope comes from Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together, O Come All Ye Faithful.
Unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name.